you have to, I believe, let small bad things happen constantly to have any agenda of your own and to get the big positive things done. And if you're like, I don't have time, I can't sleep, I need to cut back on sleep, I need to do this, I need to do that. If you don't have time, you don't have priorities. That's it. Perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing more to take away. He's an American author, entrepreneur, and public speaker. He's written a number of self-help books on the four-hour theme. He's also a successful angel investor. He's Tim Ferriss, and here's my take on his top 10 rules for success, volume two. Rule number six is my personal favorite, and I'd love to know which one you guys like the best. And as always, as you're watching, if you hear something that really resonates with you, please leave it in the comments below, put quotes around it so other people can be inspired as well, and when you write it down, it's much more likely to stick with you as well. Enjoy. I find that levels of success in almost any industry or area correlate to a person asking great questions. In some cases, they seem absurd. In fact, the hallmark, in a way, of great questions is that they sound completely ridiculous. So someone might ask, like, Peter Thiel, why can't you achieve your 10-year goals in the next six months? As a thought exercise, that's a, that's, that's a good question to answer for yourself. Uh, and these types of questions come up surprisingly often uh, with, with very, very impressive folks, whether it's in business, military, entertainment, or otherwise. And the way you can get better at questions is by studying interviews in part. So I studied Larry King, I studied Charlie Rose, I studied Terry Gross, I studied that, 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 that go down the list. Uh, I studied Tony Robbins, who does in-person, one-on-one interventions at his events in front of 10,000, 5,000 people. And he's just genius with how he uses questions to like pattern interrupt and grab someone's attention and divert them in a more product productive direction. Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant because thinking is the process of asking questions. You're asking yourself questions and then you're answering them in your own head. So if you get better at asking other people questions, you get better at asking yourself questions, which means you are a, you're improving your thought performance and level of thinking. When I'm procrastinating because there is indecision, and this is a particular breed of procrastination, in other words, if I have 10 things on my to-do list or 10 potential projects I could pursue, what to do in that situation? And what I ask myself is, which one of these, if done, will make the rest irrelevant or easier? This is a key question I ask all the time. Which one of these will make all the rest easier to do, if done first, or all of the rest of them are relevant, don't even need to do them? That is how I will then hone in on, on one piece of the puzzle. And this can be applied all over the place. But let's just say it's the double of the podcast. It could be losing weight, all right? You can see that's very, very amorphous. We need timelines, we need an amount to lose. And then you wanna make it as small as possible. So I'll give you a different example. If you, wanna, if you wanna start flossing your teeth, who likes flossing their teeth? Pretty much nobody. So how do you start flossing your teeth? Well, you wanna make it as easy as possible to develop it as part of your routine, to make it as automatic as anything else that you do consistently. And you could borrow from, say, B.J. Fogg, who's done a lot of research at Stanford and elsewhere. Make it as small as possible. Meaning, in the beginning, do less than you are capable of doing. So this is another key when you think something is too big or onerous. So it's too intimidating or it's too much of a pain in the ass. All right. So for flossing, you might say, I'm only going to floss my front two teeth. That's three gaps. That's all you're going to do. And you want to make it, again, as easy as possible. So you might use a water pick, or you might use those disposable flossing gadgets so you don't have to do uh, you know, tourniquets on your fingers, which is, is also one of the side effects of flossing that deters people. Make it as easy as possible. Now, this applies to a lot more than flossing. So I've talked to many of the people for, say, Tools of Titans, people who are eight-time New York Times bestselling authors or prolific musicians, uh, prolific music producers like Rick Rubin, who's legendary. Uh, and it all comes down to tiny homework assignments. So Rick, if he has a stuck artist, for instance, he will say, can you get me one word or one line that you might like for this song that you're working on by tomorrow? Is that possible? 
many, many homework assignments, all right? So with a creative project in the beginning, that's one. It's related to a piece of advice that I got from Neil Strauss, eight-time New York Times bestselling author. He has written for the New York Times, he's written for, the Rolling, for Rolling Stone magazine, and that is lower your standards. So he doesn't believe in writer's block. He says your standards are just too high. You're creating performance anxiety for yourself. So the advice that I got from another writer, which uh, matches with that, is two crappy pages per day. So a lot of people are like, I'm gonna kill it, I need an ambitious goal, let me do 1,500 words, 2,000 words per day for this book I'm working on. Well, there's a very high probability that you're gonna fall short of that. And then you will get demoralized, then you will get intimidated by the task, and then you will start procrastinating. So make the hurdle, make the success threshold really, really low. That's what I've done for my last three books is two crappy pages per day. That's all I need. If I don't end up using them, that's fine. I just need to get out two crappy pages. What ends up happening with the flossing, with the writing, with say exercise? If you're gonna exercise, you're making a New Year's resolution, don't make it an hour a day, four times a week. No, 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 no. Ten, and you, if you don't have an exercise habit, five to 10 minutes at the gym, three times a week, plenty. And in all of those cases, you will feel successful because you've checked your box for success. And then very often you will exceed that for extra credit, right? You'll be like, well, I'm already at the gym, I'll go for an extra 10 minutes. Well, I'm already flossing my teeth, I'll do an extra four. Well, I've already hit my two pages, but I'm feeling great and I'm in the flow. Maybe I'll do 10, maybe I'll do 20. But it prevents you from feeling like a failure. <laughs> this is very, very important. That is what derails a lot of people. And it also makes the task less intimidating. It's easy to discard, say, 10 terrible ideas and go after the one good idea. But when you start to get a little bit of momentum, uh, you can drown yourself in good opportunities that aren't great opportunities. And if you scatter your focus, you try to do 17 different product lines, you can kill your business really easily, uh, particularly when you have a small team. So I think uh, asking yourself repeatedly, what is the one project, the one initiative, the one campaign that if successful, will render the rest of these things either unnecessary or much, much easier. What is that, what is that one step? And you know, I've called it this lead domino before, but what is the one thing on this list of seven different campaigns that will make all the other ones irrelevant or much easier? How do you, I mean, that's a tough um, answer, isn't it? Because uh, they all sound good. Yeah, I think uh, I, they, they can. And I think that what it comes down to oftentimes is uh, it returns back to measurement. So how are we defining success? Like if we want to grow the company, let's just say, what does that mean? In three months, six months, what are we measuring? Why are we measuring those things? And uh, you know, what is a sort of uh, a, a comfort goal? Meaning like, okay, we think we can easily hit this number. What is a stretch and what is like, oh, hallelujah, we, we threaded sure. the needle. And, and then come up with a, a really concrete number to tackle. And once you have that number, then you can look at those five and say, all right, which of those are going to serve us right now? And I'm, I'm dealing with that uh, increasingly so because I have all these different branches of content and activities and angel investing and so on. It's very easy for me to get scattered. It's never been easier. So I have to continually ask that type of question. What, what, what's your main focus now? If you had to boil it down to one... My main focus right now is building the podcast, building my podcast, Tim Ferriss Show, up to a point where it's consistently in the top 10 to 15 on iTunes so that I can establish a presence and name recognition in Hollywood and entertainment, which I can leverage then for the TV show and film projects that I'll be expanding into in the next three to nine months. And specifically what that means is targeted advertising um, for the podcast specifically towards people who are producers, agents, actors, directors in Hollywood and New York City. All of that can be quantified. Timothy, how do I get a four hour work week? Is that possible? The four hour work week is possible, but you need to completely unplug and reset. And the reason that's necessary is because there is an epidemic, and I do mean epidemic in this country, of information abuse and information addiction, where People have come to believe that checking email 200 times per day, having a Blackberry to your head or in your hand while you're at dinner or on the subway or in your car or with your friends is the path to becoming more productive and more successful. You mean it isn't? Uh, it isn't because giving everyone around you, every person in the world, immediate access to you 
is inviting interruption and inviting minutia to completely invade your life, which is happening to everyone. Did and it happen to you? It did happen to me. I had no intention of writing this book, but from 2000 to 2004, I was working at startups in Silicon Valley. I started my own. I was CEO, and I worked from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. I checked Outlook, hitting send receive 100 to 200 times per day like a, a rat with a cocaine pellet dispenser. Slept under my cubicle, sent emails on Thanksgiving to prospects. It was a depressing scene, and it's a very, unfortunately, common scene. And I think everyone is at a point of overwhelm. There is more information than we can possibly organize. Time management is dead. There's well, a, how do you turn that, turn that around? The way you turn it around is you have to completely unplug and reset. That means that you need to take a step back, forget about what people expect you to do, forget about what's popular, and really look at what works and what is consuming your time. So there are four steps. There's definition, elimination, automation, and liberation. Definition is simple. First, you need to define your ideal lifestyle. What do you want to be doing from when you wake up to when you go to sleep? And so what do you want to have? What do you want to be? What do you want to do? And how much does that ideal lifestyle cost? And that becomes your target. Elimination is simple. It's getting rid of everything, all the static, all the noise, all the interruptions, all the micromanaging, all the people possible that interfere with getting you to that ideal lifestyle. The third automation is about taking the few remaining tasks that are important but time-consuming and either delegating, automating, or somehow outsourcing them. So in my particular case, I have an army of MBAs in India, about 25 of them who work for $4 an hour and take care of tasks that would otherwise consume hundreds of my hours. And then the last step, liberation, is about the final ingredient in lifestyle design, which is mobility, and then also how to use the time once you create it, which is very difficult for most people. Okay, this is fascinating, but that's the point. It is difficult. I mean, how mm -hmm. do you put the BlackBerry down? How, aren't you worried that you're not going to make as much money, that you're going to lose clients? Do you have statistics that show that that's not the case? I have statistics that would absolutely make your head spin. So if you're interrupted by email and phone, there was an experiment done at King's, King's College, for example, that showed that people who were stoned scored six points better on an IQ test than people who were interrupted by email and phone. Uh, wow. And that, good to know. Good to know. 26% of people in the American workforce are on the verge of a nervous breakdown. The system is not working. So it's not a question of, of if I should do this. It's a question of when. It is the only real alternative. So one simple step that people can take, a baby step to prove the concept, is to simply use an autoresponder. Set up an autoresponder that tells everyone who emails you, I will be checking email twice a day That's a great idea. at 11 and 4 p.m. Uh -huh. If you require a more urgent response before one of those two times, call me on my cell phone. Okay, if I start losing customers, I'm going to call you, Tim. You can call me. Okay. What's going to happen instead of losing customers is you'll get more done in the next 48 hours than you would in the next two weeks. In a world where people expect immediate responses, oftentimes, and increasingly so, you have to, I believe, let small bad things happen constantly to have any agenda of your own and to get the big positive things done. So it's, it's recognizing that to prevent all hurt feelings, all mistakes, all problems, all of this is impossible. And if you try to do that, you will never have a proactive schedule of your own uh, is extremely important. So effectively just saying, I'm going to accept the collateral damage and believe that what I'm embarking upon is worth more than those minor or reversible problems and then forging ahead. That's it. You, you gotta take a few flesh wounds. The Five Minute Journal is uh, it's, a, it's a journal that was created by a reader of the Four Hour Work Week. Actually, for those who have read the book, it, it was their muse. So they're one of their cash flow focused businesses in the context of lifestyle design. But you take two and a half minutes or so in the morning, and then again at night. And so one is effectively a focusing and planning exercise. There's also a gratitude component, which I think is very critical for those of us who are driven type A achievers. It's very easy to constantly be focused on the future. And just to pause for a second, I heard someone say that depression is an obsession with the past and anxiety is an obsession with the future. Well, if you look at achievers, they tend to be very future focused. And as soon as they hit a goal, they're like, don't have time to celebrate this small win. This isn't good enough. 
bigger, bigger, better, et cetera. And that is a pattern that can be very self-destructive, even if you rack up a lot of wins at the same time. So the gratitude component is extremely critical. That takes about two and a half minutes each day. And it also helps to identify your focal points or your priorities so that when inevitably that 10% that's left of the monkey mind pops up to like dance in front of you and distract you from your objectives you set out for the, the day, you can return to that. And then at the end of the day, it's, it's basically a performance review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I find it incredibly helpful and uh, uh, a lot of ROI for the time invested. Large, uninterrupted blocks of time. You have to schedule, if you are a creator, blocks of time that are at least two to four hours or more in length. No Frankenstein monster of 20 minute breaks and 10 minute breaks combined into three hours will have the value of an uninterrupted block of three hours. If you are trying to make high level decisions, focus on time consuming, high priority projects, uh, push something to a next milestone as a maker creator. We all have the same 24 hours in the day And if you're like I don't have time. I can't sleep. I need to cut back on sleep I need to do this. I need to do that. If you don't have time, you don't have priorities. That's it And so are you one of those entrepreneurs who uh, uh, likes to launch very early with a product which is not finished um, and get as much feedback as you can or are you the other school is more like you do it in secret and you, you test, you do market research, you do everything in secret and you launch when you consider it's, it's really good. So I think that you can do both actually. So I think that it's possible to get that early feedback, which is critical, without making it uh, public in the sense that you can work even with a small group of friends, which is what I did um, with the book, but also with uh, some of the startups that I'm working with. Uh, get feedback from people who represent different demographics, uh, then incorporate that into the beta when you, when you make it open. Uh, but I generally believe in, in fast sprints, so let's just say two-week development sprints, and uh, so that uh, might combine with agile uh, development, but do two-week sprints, push something out, get feedback. Take a brief rest, do another sprint, get a few features out, wait, get feedback. Uh, and uh, Google also does this on a fairly large scale. So when they launched Google News, for example, they were wondering whether they should sort by uh, location or date, uh, and there were a few other variables, and they decided that they would push it out and simply see how many requests and complaints they got related to each of those features, and almost no one asked for location. Mm. Uh, most of them asked for date, so that's the feature that they built into it in the next iteration. So I believe in, in micro-testing. Uh, I'd say that's generally my approach. Keep things simple, and when you're looking for solutions, to try to remove things first rather than to add things. This is a really, really critical principle. And less can be, no, can be more in this particular respect, especially for behavioral change. This is a sign that I have over one of my doorways in my house. Simplify. And above that, I have a knife. Why knife? Because when you make a decision, the word decision is related to incision, it means to cut off. It means to cut away other options and to commit and to focus. And that's what I recommend all of you do with whatever that skill is that you have in your head still, hopefully. Perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing more to take away. Let's, uh, let's just go to this mat here. And uh, oh wait, we got to do it the right uh, way. My, 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 gonna my Dutch catch friends, you. my Dutch friends are so killing the, me. So uh, the yeah, this is uh, so the, yeah, the end of the Nylon Mac. And then we bring the partner down. So apparently the Dutch acrobats get very upset if you don't do that. <laughs> And I've got to the point where I'm like, you know what? I've had enough with the Dutch. <laughs> I love their kickboxing, Ernesto Hoost, love you, but from all the jujitsu, I'm just like, flop. <laughs> I've, I've uh, made a lot of, I'm not gonna say enemies, that doesn't really happen in Acro. So uh, I am standing with my feet reasonably close to your yep. hips. I wanna be able to touch my flyer's feet. Yep. My feet are turned out just below the hip bones. Mm -hmm. I am standing straight up. It's almost as if you've seen the UFC. You're like open guard on your back. Here we this go. would be where I try to punch you and then you kick me in the face, but that's not acro, that's MMA. All right, and then flyer, fingers flyer. forward. You got it, you got the acronyms and everything. Just so people, you know, I, I learn, I'm a, I'm a young Padawan, just learning what I can. Dang it. And then. So the most important thing is that you understand when to be water and when to be earth and what parts of your body. So I'm gonna be watery with my arms and really sturdy with my legs. So we'll take a deep breath. On the exhale, I receive with everything and then I push up with the legs. Here, a lot of times, the flyer will want to put the hands down and practice their handstand training. That means they're a control fleek. Yeah. 
So you fold their top, the top of their hands down on the floor. So at this point, for those people listening, I am supported on Jason's feet. I'm completely upside down. I'm basically in a L straddle position, for those of you who know anything about gymnastics. Um, and so this is folded leaf, sometimes uh, in hushed tones, jokingly referred to as leaf blower. Oh my God, I didn't know that was gonna come out of the podcast. <laughs> I'm trying to help people with the images here. So this is Scarecrow, It's right? a Scarecrow. And basically what I do as a base is I try to let your body unwind patterns. So as I bounce and shake, a lot of times our mind is uh, connected to muscle groups and flexing them when they don't need to be. So the true therapist is gravity, which helps to let your spine hang like a plumb line. And, uh, and can we show, for instance, uh, let's see here, Super Yogi? Sure. So, so Tim likes traction. So what I can do is I can let my legs come off my 90 degree. His weight will start falling back. We'll take a deep breath together. On the exhale, my legs go back. And then I resist with the arms. It's okay? Mm -hmm. Two more. Inhale. Exhale. So I'm pushing the legs back and then giving resistance. I got a little... Wrist traction there. One more time. Inhale. And exhale. And then where I love to go is to open up your triceps and your shoulders. So I'm going to place my hands under his elbows and he can bend the elbows and the knees at the same rate. And can you bring the elbows closer? Does that feel okay on your shoulder? Yeah. No, I'm going to be a little careful on the left just yep. to have it reconstructed. But yeah, this feels fine. And in general, where the body can be vulnerable and the flying is in the shoulders and the lower back, so communication is, is really important and just listening to your body. All good? All good. Sweet. Side bending is also a thing that can really help the health of the lower back. And what's different with the therapeutic flying from yoga is your body doesn't have to be engaged. You're not using your muscles as the flyer, so you don't have to work uphill, basically. All right. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. So those are some basics of therapeutic flying. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'd love to know what did you take from this video? What was the most important lesson that you learned that blew your mind that you're going to immediately apply to your life or your business somehow? Please leave it down in the comments below. I'm super curious to find out. Also, if you want to nominate someone for the next top 10 video, please check the description for a link to a video where you can vote for people and put in your suggestions as well. I also want to give a quick shout out to John Sonmez from the Simple Programmer YouTube channel. John, thank you so much for picking up a copy of my my book, Your One Word, and for making that awesome video on your channel. I really, really appreciate the support, and I'm glad that you enjoyed the read. And recently, I just had the uh, the opportunity to read uh, a book that he put out, uh, which, uh, which I just did a video review on. So thank you guys again for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever Your One Word is. Much love. I'll see you soon. For every problem, uh, the problem itself presents an opportunity that dwarfs the problem. And that is to say that if I had only looked at my failure with the audiobook and viewed it as a failure in the product, let's say, and not in the process, I wouldn't have taken away much. Instead, I realized that my approach wasn't right, fixed my approach, and that has led to a lot of great successes. If you get a thousand diehard true fans who love your product, pay for it, and are relatively price insensitive, you can always scale up from there. If you try to aim for, as they would say, even boiling the ocean, you're going to run out of money. And your advertising, your marketing will be very imprecise. It will be designed, subconsciously or consciously, not to offend anyone. And as a result, you will have no diehard fans. A lot of really good uh, entrepreneurs start as a technician or a tactician, they're very, very good at one thing, then they end up in a managerial role that they hate, doesn't mean you have to stay there. And you see a lot of folks like Evan Williams and others who then at some point realize this and return to a more product focused uh, role, even if they are also the CEO making some high level 30,000 foot decisions. Okay, but if you are a maker, if you've decided to be a maker, if you just happen to be a maker or a creator, let's call it three to five hour uninterrupted blocks of time. 
are extremely critical. If you want to connect the dots, if you want to have the space to allow yourself to have original ideas, or at least original combinations of ideas, you really need to block out that time and protect it at least once a week. So in Tools of Titans, there are many people who do this. Ramit Sethi, for instance, was a very, very successful um, multi, multi-million dollar business that he built out of a blog he started uh, long ago in college, which was very, very niche in its focus. He blocks out, I believe it's every Wednesday, uh, for three to five hours of time. He'll block it out for learning. Uh, Noah Kagan, uh, another entrepreneur, does the same thing. So on Wednesdays for me, I have from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., this is pre-lunch, I have creation. That means writing, recording, or some similar aspect of in my mind, creating with, with my skill set and my assets. And uh, it is extremely important that I do that before I am barraged by inputs. In other words, and this is true of Josh as well, first thing in the morning, he's doing journaling. Reed Hoffman, billionaire, co-founder or founder of LinkedIn, same story. He will plant a seed in his mind the night before, a problem he wants to solve, a project he wants to think about, improving perhaps, and then waking up the tabula rasa, complete blank slate, immediately working on that problem with journaling before any text messages, before any email, which is why, for instance, I don't have email set up on my phone. I do not have mail set up on my iPhone. I do not get notifications. I also put my phone on airplane mode for a lot of reasons. If you've read the four-hour body, it explains some of the physical ones, but onto airplane mode when I go to bed, and it stays on airplane mode until I'm done with my creation period and then it comes on. Because as soon as you go into bullet dodging or like Wonder Woman bullet blocking mode with uh, everyone else's agenda for your time, which is very often the inbox or text messages, you're DOA, you're done. Your creativity is, is all for naught in general. So for, for me, for many people who are say programming, for musicians, for creative types, slack in the system, you have to create slack. You have to create space. You have to create large, uninterrupted blocks of time, and the only way to do that is to put it on your calendar. If it's not on your calendar, it's not real. You need to put it in your calendar and defend it just like you would anything else.